everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Maximum Octane. I am your ringleader, Kim Hakey. Joining me today is a dear friend and colleague and just so many wonderful things that I couldn't even begin to put all of it into the introduction, but we have Mr. Tom Brady. Hello, Tom. Hi, Kim. He is to get you everywhere. <laughs> he is the owner and operator of a Red Hawk Auto in Temecula, California. And so, Tom, you have had a huge career, career path, changes different things. I mean, all sort of similar, but but different. You've you've gone off on many branches in, in your lifetime and accomplished a lot of really amazing, wonderful things. And so I wanted to chat with you today a little bit and ask if you could share with, with my listeners about how after, you know, all these years and the different things you've done that you've really kind of honed into thinking like a CEO and, and operating as a CEO and all of that. And when I say that, you know, you've always been, you know, a CEO, you've had other businesses before over the years, you've ran some pretty big corporate locations and been high up in corporations and, and all of that, but, but truly fully now you have embraced that CEO mentality in taking things to a, just an entirely new level. So I'm excited to have you chat about that today for sure. So you want to give us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got here and then uh, we can get into all of the good stuff. Yes. Thank you, uh, Kim. Uh, I'm I'm an MBA and I started out working at Ford Motor Company and a Nissan Motor Company. And uh, I run dealerships in New York and California. And then I had some three other businesses and I've kind of backed into the auto service and uh, it was just bopping along. And I uh, wasn't doing very well until I joined ATI. Then we got excited about it. And now I want to really grow and take Red Hawk to the next level. It's all about growth. And to, be, and to grow, you need to be a CEO, which is a change in mentality. So I guess we have to ask the question, what is a CEO? What is a CEO, Kim? There's a lot of confusion in the independent auto industry about it. There is in many small businesses because people have the ideology that a CEO is, you know, unless you own Forbes or Ford or that you're not truly a CEO, that that's for big companies, you know, and corporations. Exactly. When we, when we think of a CEO, we think of Bill Ford at Ford Motor Company. We, we think of Elon Musk. You know, we think of Jeff Bezos at, at, at Amazon. But uh, we're actually CEOs. Let's go back. What's the textbook definition of a CEO? The CEO is somebody who manages company operations. He's directing agendas. She might manage, she will manage the organization, develop strategy. They will allocate capital in their business and they'll build their teams to succeed. And don't we do the same thing? The only, the only difference is that a big corporate CEO reports to the board of directors and they're also responsible to improve their share price. So the the only difference between us and them are those two issues and maybe they make a little more money, probably a lot more. But anyway, uh, we perform the same functions, but we do it on a smaller scale. But the problem is we get caught in the swamp between managing and leading. If we I'm want to laughing continue, with you, not at you. Yeah, really. If we want to continue doing the same thing, then we're going to continue doing that. We're going to get the same results. But if we want to grow, we're going to have to do things differently. And, and also a problem, Kim, is that if we're not thinking ahead and being CEOs, we end up getting bogged down. For example, if a service advisor doesn't show up for work, we go back on the desk. If they're having a problem in the shop, you know, we might be in there diagnosing a problem or get under the hood. But we Picking gotta- up parts, driving customers home. There's so many running to the office supply because we're out of stamps or <laughs> all yeah. of the many things. We're, we're, we're managing the now. 
And to be a CEO, we need to be looking at the future. We need, we need to be looking down the road and around the corners. We need to be looking out a year, three years, 10 years. You know, what's going on in the marketplace? We, instead of fighting fires, we need to be looking out because we end up becoming the enemy. You know, we're always entrenched in the, doing everything right now. So what do we need to grow? If we want to grow, we need to change our mindset. We need to change the way that we think. We have to stop being involved in the operations and be forward thinking. You know, when you, when you think about it, is that Albert Einstein that said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, right? And that's what we do. Unless, unless we make a conscious effort to change. Now, there's four, let's take a look at the role of the CEO. We, in, our, in our group, the CEO group, which I'm a member of, and the reason I got into it was because I wanted to grow, even though we were a small shop. I mean, some of the other guys in my group are fantastic business owners, and they have up to five shops. They're doing great. Mine was kind of small. We only had six bays. And as you recall, when you came out to the shop, we had an alignment rack and everybody said, you know, get that out of here. So we got that out. We stopped doing tires and we made room for more bays. Uh, but uh, we couldn't expand. There was nowhere to go. So I had to come up with other strategies to grow. And uh, we'll talk about that. But there's four primary uh, roles of the independent auto CEO to be to embrace in order to grow. The first is to develop a vision and strategy for our direction for growth. We have to figure out how do we want to grow and then figure out what the end result is and then work backwards. Okay, we want to increase our business a million dollars this year. And we did that. Next, we want to do another million. Then maybe we want to get up to five million. So we have to figure where do we want to be? What's it going to take? to get there. Um, I, I just, I'm so happy that you're, you're mentioning that because with everybody being in the moment and whether it's automotive repair or anything else, we, we don't have an end site in mind. So how the heck are you going to make a plan to get there if you don't know where okay. you want to be? And I always use that analogy of a GPS, right? GPSs are amazing. If you put in the proper address to where you want to get to, it gives you a great route and it gives you alternative routes to get there, right? But the That's GPS cool. doesn't tell you how to get where you're going unless you put in a stinking address. And and we do the same thing with our businesses. We are like, oh, you know, we're gonna grow, we're gonna do this or that. But they don't, we don't know what we want to grow to. We don't know what projected sales we want. We don't know how many locations. And we just expect it to all happen organically or something. I don't know, magic fairy to come in and say. Here's, yeah. how, here's how you get there, right? Right, exactly. And it doesn't happen because we get bogged down in the day-to-day -day events and then we, we just get off course. So we have to be conscious about developing that plan and deciding what we want and how to get there. So we decided since we didn't have any room, as, as you know, we had no room there, but we're on a great street in, in a good market with good demographics. Let's get a satellite location, okay? We can double our sales. So I looked around and I found a, a place down the street. It was an office industrial uh, building and I liked it, I bought it. But the problem was it was a call center. So I instantly became a contractor. And here I am working all, all these subs, you know, knocking it down <laughs> and redoing the building and putting in all this equipment. But, but we got it done. We got it done right in the middle of the pandemic right before the shortages commenced. So we got it launched and now we're using it full time. I could, I could see everybody there on my uh, my TV monitor. It's fantastic. A couple of things I just, I wanna mention, your location, you maximized every square inch in your facility. And that's one of the things that I think people don't do before they start expanding or looking for, do I need another location? Do I want a satellite location? Do I want to expand? They're not even utilizing properly what they have, where they are, and they're not maximizing the opportunities there. And so their answer is instead of digging in 
doing the hard work, fine tuning what you have is to just go, you know, get another location. And so that's one of the things that I love about your journey is you really dialed everything in and yeah. said, you know, we, we have absolutely maximized every opportunity. And the other thing too, with you, that's just so inspiring all the time. You're always see the possibilities in things instead of the problems where most people would look at a call center and say, Oh my gosh, how am I going to, you know, fix cars in there or service, you know, vehicles in there. That's not set up. The building is not, you know, doesn't have any lifts. I can't do whatever. And you looked at it and said, this is a fantastic location, fantastic building. We'll make it into what we need. And, and that's part of what I love so much about you and, and, why I think you're so successful is you always look for opportunity and possibilities and, and you don't let the other stuff get in the way. Thank you. Uh, well, we do, but now that we're doing good, the guys are getting cocky. <laughs> oh, well, let's go get another store. So my answer to them is a question. Are we ready for another store? Are, are these operations running like a Swiss watch? Uh, no. Well, then we're not going to do that yet, because if we do go out and get another one, which we want to do eventually, uh, we're going to stumble. And if there's a shock in the economy or something, you know, we could fail and it could pull us the whole organization down. So we have to be careful. We want to grow in stages and don't go to the next one until we've mastered the current one. Love, love that. Love yeah. that. Well, let me get back to... Uh, develop our strategy. We use, uh, ATI uses uh, the line report. They're great prognosticators. They're looking out ahead to give us some indication of where we're, where we're going. And their most recent report says that over the next four years, the industry, the independent industry is gonna grow $94 billion. I go, wow, I like that. Where's the growth <laughs> gonna be? Well, the growth's gonna be in the foreign nameplates and in hybrid electrics. So I'm saying foreign name fives. Hmm. That'd be nice just to get that business, but it doesn't work that way. You know, people aren't just gonna drive by and all of a sudden stop into our shop just because they need an auto repair. They're gonna go where they feel they can trust the business that they know what they're doing. So we need to look out and say, all right, how can we get on the front end of that surfboard and ride the wave instead of being behind it and trying to play catch up. And uh, the, the answer really is to think about our branding, you know, to plan ahead, you know, make sure our branding is such that people are gonna perceive that we're the type of business that can satisfy their repair and service needs. We gotta look at our marketing, our internet presence. You know, when somebody types in BMW auto repair near me, boom, we want Red Hawk to come up not somebody else, uh, our, our website. Of course, we have to have techs that can repair these vehicles. So we have to start training now to make sure that they're proficient in repairing a BMW or a Mercedes or these quirky Audis, you know? We, <laughs> everybody needs to know what they're doing. And we have to have a facility that's inviting to them. You know, they're upscale. Our place needs to look good. It can't be sloppy, et cetera. And then lastly, the front counter and our receptionists, they need how to talk to these folks. You know, they're sophisticated, they're educated. We need to be able to talk to them and talk about the features and benefits of their vehicles. So what we're doing, Kim, is we're looking out ahead. Okay, we wanna capture this business and we're trying to say, okay, what do we need to do to accomplish that result? And then work backwards and, and implement all these things. And as we talked about before, you know, getting a third store, that's a great, that's a great goal, but we have to be ready for it. Can't just go out and do it haphazardly or it's going to cost us. Okay. What else does a CEO need to be doing? He needs to develop his culture. And what do we mean by that? Culture is what we as a company stand for. It's our business personality. It's our reputation in the community. It's our customer service philosophy. Culture is how we treat our customers. You know, how do we use goodwill? 
What's our refund policy when we have problems? What is our internet, the website presence? And how do we handle a bad review? And as we talked earlier, we've been working really hard on that, not just recently, but for the past five or six years to get up to our 610 reviews right now at 4.8 stars. And we take it seriously. You know, when my manager first started with us, I was preaching and reviewing. He's going, oh, what the hell? That's not important. I go, yes, it is. It's vitally important. And then once he saw people coming in, when he'd ask him, hey, how did you hear about us? Why did you come in? Oh, you know, I just typed in uh, auto service near me and boom, Red Hawk came up to the top and you have great reviews. And these people are the ones that are down at the bottom of the marketing funnel where they're ready to purchase some services. And as Mike Bennett, our great coach, keeps telling us, other shops don't have the tax now. Some are going out of business, but these people still have automotive news. So they're going to go on the internet and search for us. And you want to come up to the top when they're doing that search. So the CEO drives the culture of the business, and it's only the CEO. He's the chief role model. So my behavior, the CEO's behavior, has to be consistent with what we preach. Okay, we have to preach the right gospel, and then we have to follow it. And From only- while you're speaking about that, what, another thing that I love about you and, and Red Hawk is your approach to customer service and you wanting to provide five-star service to your external customers, right? And in order to do that, your internal customers have to understand what is five-star service and tweaking little words, you know, just how you answer them and saying, saying, yeah, I can take care of that To It would be my pleasure. And that's something that I think differentiates you from other shops and other small businesses is you really look at this as a service that you're providing for your external customers. And how do we handle that on a five-star level? And you do the same for all of the wonderful and amazing things you do for your internal customers. Thank you. That's a great segue into the next topic, training. Yay. That's the other vital role that a CEO needs to embrace and that he needs to work on. The CEO needs to grow the leadership team. Okay. We have to train the trainer. So I need to train my leadership team on how I think and what we want as a company and where we should be. And and I want them to know that I don't need money that bad that, you know, I have to grab every single piece out there. If we make a mistake, we're going to give the people their money back or we're going to give them some goodwill or we're going to do something. We're going to do whatever it takes to make the customer happy. We have to put another part in whatever it is. I just want them happy because they're going to talk about us in the community and they are our, our customer, our future customer. So we need them to feel really good about our business. And, I need my people to know how to handle them and, to, and it, make it come from their heart so that they're doing the right things all the time. I always tell them when they have a question, Tom, what should we do here? So, well, it's real simple. What's right for Red Hawk? If you ask that question and you answer, you're going to get the right answer because it takes the nepotism out, takes all the issues out, and you're going to do what's right for Red Hawk, you're going to do what's right for your business. And it answers every single question. You just mentioned about the, the potential customer. So if you have a disgruntled external or internal customer out, you know, running around and saying things in town or at birthday parties or, you know, whatever things that they're out and participating, it, it could have a, a really for effect on, on your potential sure. customers, yeah. right? And so Absolutely. again, that part of that role of, of a CEO, when you talk about looking at the future, you're protecting that and you're looking and saying every action we do today and every way we treat our internal and external customers could have an effect on our future one. So it's always that mindset of looking forward and how will this affect the future, right? Absolutely. Every little piece becomes part of the whole process. And uh, they know how I think, and they have the authority to handle problems right away. They know if we got a bad review, they got to jump on it immediately. Call the customer, find out what happened. 
make that customer happy. And nine out of 10 times we do. It's very rare that, that we don't. Uh, so we work hard on that. Uh, I also wanna mention in terms of training, I love ATI's CEO, COO program. It's, I mean, it's fantastic. When we when you first launched it, I wasn't sure. I mean, I was just a little tiny shop. Other guys had multiple shops, but but I wanted to grow, and I, and I think I had the right mentality. So I got involved with them, and the, and the guys are fantastic. But what I really like, in addition to changing our mindset, is the fact that there's a COO part to it, the chief operating officer, our manager, because I could have all these glorious ideas, <laughs> want to do all this neat stuff. But if my manager and our management team doesn't implement it, it's not going to happen. He's got to be on the same wavelength as me. And what's cool about the COO program is they trail us and they're learning the same stuff that we do. And they're in there with 17 of the best managers in the country. My guy loves being in there. It's fascinating. It's stimulating. He's learning so much beyond just sales management. He's running how to run a business. And it's fascinating, and he loves it. Uh, the other thing on training that I, I try to do is people come to me all the time. Hey, Tom, what should I do here? You know, I need help with that. And in the past, I just tell them what to do or bark out orders. And I, and I was talking to my coach Mike about it once. He goes, "Really, Tom? He says you're being directive. So why don't you flip it around?" And just ask them a question. So the next time they come to you and they say, Tom, what should I do here? Just turn around and say, hey, what do you think we should do? Make them think. Then he does it again. Tom, what should we do here? Well, I don't know. What do you think? And then before you know it, they start thinking on their own. That makes them think. And I want them to do the same thing with their people. And to give you another example, uh, Sal, our manager, was off last Tuesday. So he comes in Wednesday, he goes, Sal, how was your day off? Oh, God, Tom, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it'd be refreshing. No, it was terrible. I know, well, how come? Well, because everybody was calling me all day long, asking me for stuff. I said, oh, really? How come they were asking you? So, well, they, they needed an answer. I said, well, did they know the answer to the question? He goes, yeah. I said, well, why didn't you turn around and ask them what they should do? If you keep doing that to them, they're going to start thinking and they're not going to come to you all the time because all they wanted to do basically was take the monkey off their back and put it on Sal's and Sal was embracing it. He enabled mm -hmm. it. He said, oh, sure, I'll take your monkey. He was getting some pretty, pretty broad shoulders there and uh, back for sure. Yeah. So anyway, let me finish. Uh, he was off yesterday. It was the last day of the month that we we're really pushing, you know, to hit a number, which we did. But he wasn't there. It was a good test. So I talked to him at night, you know, after everything was over. I said, how, how did the day go? He goes, oh, man, that's fantastic. We hit our numbers and nobody bothered me. I go, oh, really? How come? He said, because during the whole week, anytime anybody asked me for something, I knew they knew the answer. I would just turn around to them and say, hey, what do you think? And by golly, they started doing it and stopped answering, asking me questions all the time. That so, is fabulous. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, a CEO needs to provide and allocate all the financial resources or whatever resources. And, and at Wolf, you know, I had to go in and I, I bought the building. Then I had to pay for all the contractors. Then we bought all the equipment. So I had to have the money to do all that. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's going to fail. So one important thing is you, you can't be undercapitalized when you attempt growth because you're going to need more money for advertising. You're going to need more money for equipment and you're going to need to hire the best team members you can. They're going to be expensive. So you got to keep that in mind. Okay. So uh, those are the four things. And if, if you want me to sum it up uh, to be a good CEO, you need a change in mentality. That is, if you want to grow, if you don't want to grow, keep doing the same thing you're doing. But if you want to grow, you got to change where you, what you're, how you're thinking. You got to get out of the now, get out of the swamp between management and leadership. And you got to go from managing to leading. And basically, we got to get out of the way. We got to work ourselves out of the, the operation. 
So we, how do we do that? We set the strategy, the direction for growth. We develop a great culture for our customers and our internal customers. Uh, do we develop our leadership team and we allocate our resources. And then we go to Europe. <laughs> that is a that is a wonderful thing to be able to do. So you mentioned Tom about you have to be able to provide the resources, right? That that they yep. need. And that's another disconnect that I see with business owners sometimes. They they open a new location or they have this great idea on this new project and they don't truly have the funding for it. So they're setting their people up for failure because they're wanting to to do it on a shoestring budget. So, yeah. you know, like if you think about just this satellite location, if you didn't have all the equipment in there that you needed, and then you say, go forth, you know, make this profitable, make this a great place to, to work and all of that. And, and you don't provide the resources, they're, they're destined to fail. And then it's like, what the heck did we do this for, right? So you really have to make sure that you lay that foundation. And I, I think it's just so fabulous to watch that evolution of truly that mindset, right? And there's so many books that that people can read about it. You know, the e-myth of changing, you know, it's a, a difference between you being the worker, you know, somewhere and then becoming the business owner and leader. But then the CEO is is a, another step beyond that, right? The the oh. the e-myth of not only being a leader, but that true CEO for sure. And another book that I love too, because you mentioned about Sal and being your COO is make the noise go away. That's a great book for people to, to read because for you to be able to be the visionary and really plot the plan for the future, you need to know that you're, you're covered as far as somebody to, to implement the things for you. Right. And so Absolutely. if you don't choose the right CEO, it makes your job as a CEO so much more difficult. And many times we take somebody that might be a great service advisor or a great technician or a great, whatever business you're in. And we say they do a great job at X. So they're going to be a great COO. And that is not always always the case right it's, I the same very... problem. well i had a manager for years and then all of a sudden he left to go manage something else and i was in panic because he was also our lead tech so like, what the hell am i going to do so i hired somebody quickly but it was a bad decision i made a really bad decision and we started going down so then i immediately went back out to the marketplace and looked around and found the best gentleman that i could we got sal and and as a result this year our sales are up 68 percent I mean, uh, just by making those changes and he, he brought along some other people that were A players and now we have a fantastic organization and a good bench. So that makes all the difference in the world. It is, it is truly amazing. So on, on your journey, going from being, you know, a, a phenomenal manager and uh, holding different positions at Ford and Nissan and other things, the dealerships and, and other businesses you've owned, You've learned a lot along the way, uh, to, to say, to put it mildly, what is an unproductive habit that you had that you have exchanged for a productive one? And what impact has that had for you? Yeah, we talked about it before and it's, I want to mention it again, because it's so critical in it. And I, and I never really thought about it. It's moving from being directive to asking questions, interrogative. And th that is so powerful because it it empowers your team. It makes them think, you know, I don't want to be sitting here barking out orders. And then if I go away, they can't do anything, you know, uh, and, the, and the place falls apart. This way we make our people actively think of what they're doing and what the solution is. So don't just come to me with a problem. Come to me with a solution if you need help. You know, what, or what would A, B, and C solutions be to this problem? And don't come to me for silly little stuff. And I'm going to flip it right back to you. So I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I just get in the habit of doing it. It's, it's easy to fall out of it. But if you keep practicing it, you know, it becomes a habit. And uh, it's very, very effective. I, I love it. And then one other thing, too, Kim, I used to micromanage a lot. You know, that comes back from, you know, corporate habits, micromanaging. Uh, I, I cut that out, too because that could be demoralizing to people. And I just worked through the manager and say, hey, this guy's not doing his job, why not? You know, what can we do to help him? 
what resource do we need? What do we need here? What do we need there? So, you know, I, I pull myself out away from it and try and let the organization handle the issues. Wonderful, wonderful words of advice and habits are hard to change for sure. So you got to keep at it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I just, as always, enjoy you. And I've, I've just loved to see all of all of the things over the years that that you've been able to do. So everybody stay safe, make good choices and stay inspired. And I will talk to you next week. Bye bye.